So, open up your Bibles to Psalm 119. And once you get your Bibles open, keep them open, because there's obviously, it's Psalm, if you know Psalm 119, it's the longest chapter in the entire Bible. It's 176 verses. We're only going to cover the first half today. <laughs> Preach. Preacher, preacher joke, right? Psalm 119 is a pretty amazing chapter. Last week, um, when I was here, we, we looked at the, the parable of the soils, and Jesus explained that the key to the parable of the soils is, is that the word is the seed. And my prayer was that you, would, that you would dig down deep into God's word this week, and you would draw strength from it. And as I dug down deep in the word this week, I was taken to, over and over and over, Psalm 119. The entire psalm is just a magnification of God's word. It is written by an anonymous author. Um, that I'm just going to call him the psalmist uh, as we go through this. But it's not attributed to David. It's, uh, it's, it's an acrostic, which is kind of cool. Uh, it's a literary device that each line, or each letter, the first letter of each line begins with the letter of that, the, the same letter. Hebrew alphabet, there's 22 letters. There are 22 paragraphs, 22 blocks of scripture. The first is Aleph, the second is Bet, the third is Gimel. Uh, hey, I got it right. I don't know any Hebrew. Um, but, so the first eight verses all begin with Aleph. The second eight verses all begin with Bet, and it goes all the way down through the Hebrew alphabet. And the reason that we do that as authors is to give us a sense of form, but to really force us to focus in on what we're trying to say in a measured and constrained way. We, can, we may have an idea of what we want to say, but we want to say it with such precision that every word we use matters. It's, it's, a, it's a poetic or literary device. So, <clears throat> Psalm 119 it was, um, it was written by an anonymous author, and the purpose of the psalm is this guy, whoever it is that wrote it, is being persecuted or afflicted by men of rank or authority, and they were ridiculing his beliefs, and they were seeking to put him to shame, uh, causing him to give up his faith. Okay? Just from that alone, this psalm becomes one of the most important things that we can commit to memory. Not all 176 verses, but chunks of it. Because do we live in a society where we are persecuted by people of rank and authority, people who say they know better than us, people who will ridicule us for, us, ridicule us for our beliefs, who would seek to put us to shame, causing us to, if not give up our faith, just to make our faith, um, just to put it aside as if we don't have anything to add to the conversation? Does that sound like a fair estimate of our society today? That's exactly what the psalmist was undergoing. So you'll see this theme as we go throughout the psalm. And the entire psalm, 176 verses. There are um, 176 verses. I think all but four, the most conservative estimates, mention the word of God in one form or another. And in mentioning the word of God, I learned this uh, probably in third or fourth grade as I was learning how to write. I learned what synonyms were. So synonyms go great in your oatmeal. No, they don't, right? Cinnamon goes great in your oatmeal. Synonyms make writing better. Because if you just, if there was 176 verses where it just talked about the word of God, the word of God, the word of God, the word of God, eventually you would get tired of hearing about the word of God because the repetition is gonna just make your mind go numb. So the psalmist uses uh, about 10 different synonyms throughout 176 verses to talk about the word of the Lord. And I want, to go over just a, I want to go over them with you. He talks about the word of God as law. It occurs 25 times and it denotes uh, direction or instruction. The word, word in Hebrew is debar. It occurs 20 times and it's a general term for God's revelation. The word saying, uh, uh, or it's often translated promise, occurs 19 times and it's a poetic synonym for the word debar, which is word. So the word of God, the saying of God. The, it, he talks about commandments. It occurs 22 times total. He, statutes, uh, 21 times. Judgments, 23 times. Precepts, 21 times. Testimony, 22 times. Or 23 times. He talks about God's word as the way, 11 times in total. And he also talks about it as the path. Right? The reason that I bring this up and I, and I told you how many times, is in 176 verses, the psalmist refers to God's word 190 times. Okay? That is huge because he, he emphasizes um, different characteristics, different ideas of God's word, of, of what it is to us. It is revelation. It is a way. It is a path. It is a precepts. There are judgments and commandments. 
And each of these highlights a function of what God's word is in our lives. So, uh, in order to... I know this is all introduction, so I'm glad you guys still have your Bibles open. One of the unique things about God's word to the believer is we look at it as authoritative. Do you know why we look at it as authoritative? It's kind of a circular argument. We look at God's word as authoritative because it testifies to itself. Theologians call it the the self-attesting nature of God's word. It attests to itself uh, as the words of God. So we're in numbers right now. I don't know how many times in Sunday school. I don't know how many times throughout Genesis, Exodus, and Leviticus we have heard God say, thus says the Lord. And because thus says the Lord, we believe it as the words of God. It is his words. It is authoritative. It testifies to itself, okay? Because there is no higher authority to prove it. We can't prove this is God's word, but it declares of itself that it is God's word. And as we have studied it, we have shown it over and over and over to be true. It has never let us down. Therefore, we look at it as authoritative, right? The um, archaeology has gone to sites that are talked about in the Bible, and it has uncovered pottery and weapons and even uh, stone tablets that have uh, not proven the the word of the Lord, but testified to what it already declared for us. So centuries after a battle has happened, archaeologists will go back to the place where they believe it happened and find evidences of a battle, and they'll go, this is this probably refers to what God has already said. It's not proving it, it's affirming it. That makes sense. Historical, like, historical accuracy, we know that there are certain dates that things have happened throughout Scripture that we have learned later on that the Bible said happened. We don't need archaeology or historical documentation to prove the word of the Lord is true. We know it because it testifies to itself. There is no higher authority than the word of God. And I need to point out in the culture that we live in today that there is no higher authority than the word of God. So your feelings don't matter. Your feelings do not trump the word of God. If you feel a certain way about a certain thing, let's say I feel like I'm a cat. Am I a cat? No, right? I'm no more a cat than I am a woman. But the world would say, because I feel that I, am in, uh, I was born in the wrong body, that, no, that my feelings should be affirmed against the truth of the word of God, and that is wrong. It is wrong all day long. I pr- There's another reason to pray for our young people, the folks in school who have to endure the, these, you know, the, the trainings and the teachings and the teachers who get the teachings that are supposed to matriculate it down and through their classroom, unbeknownst to, what the, unbeknownst to the parents who have kids in those classrooms. Uh, I don't want to run for school board, but I can see at some point I'll be on a school board because they're going to need a voice of logic and rational and truth. But feelings, our feelings are not an authority over the word of God. And because God, the, the word of God testifies to itself as an authority, It is our highest authority because of who wrote it, right? God inspired it. It is his words. It is his desires. It speaks into our life. And because that is the case, it is right for us to order our lives around what it says. We don't get to alter our lives or or alter the word of God around what we feel or what we prefer or what we like. We go to the word of God for the source of truth, right? Ancient words, ever true. We're going to get into some parts, uh, God willing, of, the, of Psalm 119, and it's going to talk just about that. It's going to talk about God's word being fixed in the heavens and him being faithful to all generations. Let me tell you, it is fixed in the heavens. It is not transient. I'll just, uh, I don't even know which one of my verses it's going to be at. Uh, we'll get there, I promise. Psalm 119, verse 4. The psalmist declares, you have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Okay, you have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Fully means completely, right? Another synonym. You have laid down precepts in your word that are to be completely obeyed. Not haphazardly, not as I want to, not as it strikes me in this moment, not after I screw up this one time, but fully obeyed. God expects out of his word total obedience, but we go, I'm not perfect. I can't do it on my own. I, I, there's, there's so much in there that I don't know. So get in there and know it. 
and read the 15 minutes a day, you can read the Bible in a year at 15 minutes a day. I also, so here's the thing. Uh, it's a principle of life that I have found out. How long does it take a person to get in shape? Ballpark. <laughs> a long time, right? Let's say you worked out for six hours each week, okay? Six hours, let's go, no, let's go five hours. It'll be a little easier because numbers are hard. Let's say you worked out five hours each week, five days a week for one hour, or one day a week, five hours at a time. Which person's going to get in shape quicker? The five day a weeker, because it's about consistency, not intensity. If you show up in God's word every single day, remember a couple weeks ago I talked about the statistics that one to three days a week, the results of the influence of God's word, God's word in your life are almost negligible. But when you hit that magical mark of four days a week, instances of loneliness, depression, uh, unhappiness in relationships, um, personal vices such as alcoholism, sexual sin to include pornography, all of that drops dramatically just by being in God's word minimum four days a week. It's about consistency, not intensity. So you cram for Sunday school because you haven't done your week's reading and you do it all Sunday morning, you wake up really early, not as good as if you are in it and marinating in it every, you know, one day, yeah, look, I'll give you allowance. Some days I miss a day. Uh, it happens, right? But consistency versus intensity, and that's God's word. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. If you don't know what to obey, get in there and find out. If you're struggling in an area of your life, you go, God, my finances are all out of whack. Read what God has to say about finances. Just do a quick Google search about the Bible and money, and you will be blown away about how much it has to say and where it ought to be put. The expectation is fully obeyed, not haphazardly, right? And, and yes, I will grant you, we can't do it. But we also don't, and like, we don't go to God's word with the expectation or with the idea, God forbid, I know it's wrong, but God will forgive me. I can't think of something that's going to break the heart of the Lord more because I have been so much more lately being impressed upon that God is my father, right? I, 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 I said this morning I prayed over Lily because she had a stomach ache and I can't fix her stomach ache and I'm her daddy and that makes me feel helpless, but I have a daddy and he is able to look at her with compassion, and he is able to do something in her abdomen that I can't do. I need my father. Sometimes when I'm a really bad father, I need to check out, and I need to go spend time with my father so that he can get me in line so that I can come back and get my children in line. I need to hear from my father. <clears throat> Shoot, how did I get there? Uh, you laugh, I'm really... Uh... Help me out, because I know there was a purpose. This would be fully obey. Yeah, that's where we're at. This would be the part where we edit out the YouTube upload. <laughs> this isn't the part of the sermon that we clip for a reel. Right? Uh, God is my father. Oh, yeah, breaks the heart of a father. See, I knew we'd come back to it. If I know what God says is wrong and I do it intentionally knowing it's wrong with the expectation that he's going to forgive me, nothing is going to break God's heart more because I know with my kids that's exactly how I feel. When I tell them to do something and they know I've told them to do something 17 times just like God does in his word and they still don't do it and I'm like, why didn't you do it? And you get to learn your children really well. The guilt trip doesn't work on Alice at all. None. But Lily, you give her the I'm disappointed in you speech, oh, it will crush her. Guess which one she gets? Routinely. And I tell her, honey, I asked you to do this, and you didn't do it. It just it breaks my heart that you would disrespect me like that. Oh, daddy, I'm so sorry, I'll never do it again. And they're... Don't look at that as manipulative. Look at it as knowing your children because I bet God doesn't speak to you all the time in the same tone. Sometimes you can, he can convict you and go, I'm disappointed in you. You know my word and you did it anyway. You keep, you know, like a dog returns to its vomit, so a fool repeats its folly. Sometimes God's just got to smack you upside the back of your head and get your attention. 
right? It's when David, or Nathan came to David and he explained to him that David was the man in the story that he talked about. You went and killed the ewe lamb, the person only had one lamb. And when Nathan goes, thou art the man, David was crushed. It wasn't that he was disappointed. David was, David was incensed in how the man treated his friend. God sometimes needs to just grip us and get a hold of us, and it's because he expects his word to be fully obeyed. Look again, look, move down with me to verses 9 and 10. The psalmist records, How can a young man keep his way pure? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Don't let me stray from your commands. And then look at verse 20. It says, My soul is consumed with longing for your laws at all times. He asks, How can a young man keep his way pure? How can a young man keep his way pure? There is a way in this world that is impure. How does he keep it pure? How does he stay on the right path? How does he stay on the narrow path, Jesus would say? By living according to your word. I would ask any young man, do you want your way to be pure? There's a couple young men in this audience. Do you want your way to be pure? Or, do you, or is it easier to go along with your friends, to do what they want to do, to, to follow a, a negative example, to be involved in actions and, and, and words and, and whatever that are impure, that aren't right, that you know in your heart aren't right? If you want your way to be pure, I'm telling you, it's not going to be easy. And it's, you're going to encounter the same kind of derision and mockery that the psalmist wrote. That's why he wrote this. He wrote this because there were people trying to get him to abandon his face and jettison what he believed about God to, make, to compromise and to make his way impure. But he says, how can he keep his way pure? By living according to your word. It's not going to be easy, but the beauty of living according to your word is you don't have to do it on your own. Jesus left us, and when he left us, he said, it is better for me to go because when I leave, you're going to get the comforter, the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the advocate, the counselor, the one who gifts you and strengthens you, the one who, when you go before kings and rulers and authorities, and that's another part of Psalm 119 that I guarantee we're not going to have time to get to today, that when you go before kings and rulers and authorities, the Holy Spirit will give you the words to say. That's what he's saying. When you're persecuted, when you're afflicted, when you're mocked, when you're ridiculed, the Holy Spirit is the one strengthens your backbone and helps you stand up a little bit better, that gives you the words to say. And if, if, if nothing else, it's just because your only defense would be because it's not in the Bible, and I've chosen to live my life according to the Bible. If a young man wants to keep his way pure, it's going to take a strong backbone in the midst of mounting peer pressure to say, I choose to live according to the Bible. Verse 20, my soul is consumed with longing for your law at all times. Not his body, not his passions, his soul. The eternal part of who we are. When God breathed into us the breath of life, he gave us a, a part of, an eternal part of himself. The part of us that when we die goes to be with the Lord is the soul. And he says, it is my soul, the eternal part of me, that longs for your law at all times. I desire it. I crave it. Uh, when sometimes when uh, for work I have to go away for training for extended periods of time and I will be gone for a week and though I can talk to Lynette on the phone I long to be with her and my family my heart and my affection are drawn home and I don't want to be in Colorado anymore I want to be in Milton of the only time in my life I've ever wanted to be in Milton but now I want to be there because that is where my longing and my soul is and he says that's what it's like for the child of God to be longing, your soul craves and desires God's word at all times. Not sometimes, not when it's convenient, not just when I'm tempted and I feel like I'm about to give in, at all times. He's going to go on to say, I will meditate on your law. Meditate on it day and night, that it would always be on my lips. And maybe the psalmist is setting up something that, fee that seems to be an unrealistic expectation. Like, God, how can I do this all the time? My mind all the time is being pulled in 17 different directions. But maybe it's just that in that moment that you need to stop and center on God and just remember who you are in him, what you have in him, and what he's gifted you to do because of him living inside you. We need God's word. Jesus talked about it. He said that God's word. We don't live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Father. This is like food, spiritual food to our souls. If we are feeling distant from God, we need only open his book and find out where he can meet our very deepest need. 
It's what God does to us when, he, when we open up His Word. Verse 28, Psalm 119, verse 28. My soul is, here we go, my soul is weary with sorrow. Strengthen me according to your word. It's very similar to verse 50. My comfort and my suffering is this, your promise preserves my life. My soul is weary with sorrow. I'm broken down. My heart is hurt. My soul, this guy is hurt at the soul level. Whatever's going on in his life has damaged him and hurt him so badly. His soul is weary with sorrow. So he asked God to strengthen him through his word. That's one of the things we do from God's word. We draw strength from it. We read it. We read stories about people who have gone through what we've been through. We read Proverbs about the, when we need wisdom and we can say, uh, I'm going to go back to that dog as a dog returned to its vomit so a fool repeats its folly. We have certain sins that keep tripping us up and we know this. Sometimes they're personality driven. Sometimes we don't Sometimes we worry too much and we say, God, I'm a worrier. And God would say, no, you're a warrior, right? If you worry about this, pray about it more. Become a prayer warrior, not a worrier. It's a clever preacher thing. It's what we do with words. We just kind of change it a little bit and make it memorable. So I hope that helps someone today. But uh, we draw strength from God's word so that Steve giggle. <laughs> We draw strength from God's word. It is a source of our strength. Physical strength, like nourishment, like food nourishes the body, God's word nourishes us so that when, we are, when our soul is weary and we are broken down, we receive strength through the word of God. Verse 50, my comfort and my suffering is this, your promise preserves my life. I am suffering, I need comfort. How many people know someone who is suffering right now and what they need is comfort? The comfort comes in knowing that the promise of God preserves their life. I said the God's word is authoritative. There is no higher authority. That's why when God's word testifies to itself, it can't be trumped by anything else. And the promises of God, the promises of God preserve life. They strengthen us. We draw comfort. We draw strength from them. And that's why we need it. That's one of the reasons we hide it in our hearts. Because at some point, you're going to be with someone, and you're not going to have a Bible, and you're going to need to know what God says about it. You're going to, there's going to be a word, a, a verse, something that will come to your mind in that moment through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, because it says he will lead and guide you into all truth, that you will have the very words that the person needs to hear. It has happened to me so much when men inside the prison, when men are at the point of conversion, God will bring a verse to my mind that I hadn't read or studied in so long, but in that moment, I have shared verses. Galatians 4, 7 comes to mind. In Galatians 3, the end of Galatians 3, it talks about in Jesus Christ, we are sons of God, right? And this part of that whole father thing that I was telling about, how I relate to God as my father. In Jesus Christ, I am a son. That means God is my father. In Galatians 4, 7, it says, in Christ Jesus, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then also an heir. And that is not a verse that should drive someone to repent until you're talking to a drug addict whose his whole life has been a loser, a reject, a failure, a fiend, an addict. And you say, look, you were a slave to whatever gripped you up. But Bible says, in Christ Jesus, you're not a slave, a fiend, a loser, an addict, a junkie. In God's eyes, you're a son. And when they know that they are not what they used to be, but by the grace of God, they, don't, they are something new through Jesus Christ, from a slave to a son, it will make them weep tears of joy. God will give you the words you need in the moment if you ask him. Right? That's what he says. If you lack wisdom, ask me. Just believe that I'll give it to you. Don't doubt. Don't be double-minded. Don't be unstable. Believe that you will get from God and he will give to you because he wants you to advance his cause in this world. And it may start just by changing one life, changing one perspective, just flipping one person's day around. There's lots of stories uh, along those lines and you've probably read the daily bread things and, and the, the testimonies of how God used a, a Christian I'll give you one. I have a friend. He was, he was at wit's end. He's battled uh, depression and mental health um, for a good part of his life. And when they built the new bridge over for the connecting 147 to 15, the really, really high one there above Nori, he was walking down the bridge. He was going to jump off of it. And a friend called him in that moment and said, hey, buddy, how you been? 
God laid it on my heart to reach out to you. And he could hear the traffic whizzing by in the background of the phone. And my friend goes, I'm not good. He goes, hey, I'm coming. I know where you are. I know what you're doing. Get back in your car. I'll be right there. God does these things in the lives of people. And it was a phone call from a friend. And look, had he, had he called him and he wasn't there, do you think he would have been upset that his buddy checked in on him just kind of a, hey, how you doing? No, but in that moment, that was the phone call that saved his life. I mean, I, I, if I had time, I'd tell you the way God has used him to inspire countless other lives. And that candle would have been snuffed out if he, if he had continued on the path he was doing and he had not trusted in God. Verse 32, Psalm 119. I run in the path of your commands, for you have set me free. It's very similar to verse 45. I will walk about in freedom, for I have sought out your precepts. I run in the path of your commands, for you have set me free. Oftentimes, we don't look at commands as being freeing. We're given commands, and when we think of commands, we tend to think of the thou shalt nots. Don't do this, don't do that. The law, when we look at laws in this society, they tell us what we can't do, right? I can't drive 100 miles on the highway because the sign tells me I can't. But this says that I run in the path of your commands, for you've set my heart free. There is freedom in following the Lord, a freedom that we think we have apart from God. We are free to do whatever we want. There aren't any bounds, there aren't any limitations on our behavior at all. And we don't realize, the Bible says in that moment, we are slaves to sin. We can do whatever we want, but everything that we do is self-serving, self-seeking, self-preserving because we don't understand in our sin that self is the problem. We do everything we can to gratify our sinful nature. We look out for me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity of this world. But God's commands has set our heart free to, that we no longer desire the things we used to desire. We don't pursue the things we used to pursue. We don't crave the things that we used to crave. God takes us and turns us around and sets us on a new path according to his commands. And now I run in the path of your command. I stumble in my sin, but I run in God's command because he has set me free. James 1.25 says, The man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, will be blessed in what he does. If you look into the perfect law that gives life, said we look at laws as inhibiting, as laws that would restrict us, but God's law gives life. And because of that, he will bless us if we, can, if we read it, and don't forget it, right? It can't go in one ear and out the other. It's got to go in one ear and then make our way into our hearts so that we hide it there. If we don't forget it and we do what it says, we'll be blessed. Sitting in church, hearing me preach is great. I, am, I invite you to do it and bring other people to hear it. But it's not near as good as when you leave here doing what we talked about, what we heard about from the Word of God. Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's a lace up your boots and get in the game kind of thing. <clears throat> verse, uh, ooh, which one? Let's go to verse 59. I think we're probably going to have to... Oh, shoot, there's so much, so much. Verse 59, the psalmist writes, I've considered my ways and I have turned my steps towards your statutes. I've considered my ways the ways that I walk, the actions that I do, the things that I want to do. These are my ways, not God's ways. I've considered my ways and have turned my steps towards your statutes. That's a picture of repentance. I was doing what I wanted to do. I was going the way that I wanted to go. And I have turned my steps towards your statutes, towards that perfect law that gives life. That is a beautiful verse. If you're, if you're witnessing to someone and they're just struggling with their life, I don't understand. I thought it would be easier. I, I, I believe in God. I know God would be like, well, okay, have you considered your ways? David did that. David considered his ways. And he asked the Lord to reveal them to him. And he says, now, if there's any offensive way, lead me in your way, in the way everlasting. That's what he says at the end of Psalm 139. I'll probably read that verse as we get ready to, to prepare our hearts for communion here in a little bit. As we seek the mind of the Lord, we would consider our ways and then that we would turn 
we would repent of them and turn them towards God's statutes because that is God's desire, that we would forsake our ways because his way, though narrow, is true. Let me give you one more. Let's go to 89. Psalm, or verse 89. Let me read it. No, oh, there we go. Your word, O Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Your word, O oh Lord, is eternal and it stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. Your laws endure to this day for all things serve you. James 1.17 says that God does not change like shifting shadows. He is the, every good and perfect thing we have comes from him. He's fixed. He doesn't change like shifting shadows. The stars go across the sky, right? As the sun goes across the sky, the things that are fixed, it casts a shadow on the ground. God doesn't change. He is fixed. His laws are fixed. His word is eternal. It is fixed in the heavens. His faithfulness continues to all generations. His faithfulness, when he made his covenant with Abraham, we are beneficiaries of that covenant today because his promise to Abraham didn't stop with Abraham. Abraham went to Isaac and Jacob, and from Isaac and Jacob then to Joseph, and this covenant from Joseph then to Moses, and from Moses through Joshua, and it went all the way down, and I'm running out of stage, so the historical timeline has to stop. But his faithfulness endure, endures to all generations because if it had stopped with one generation, we don't have the benefit and the blessing of the promise of the covenant that was given centuries and centuries ago. That's why words like this matter. His faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth and it endures. It keeps going. There will come a time, though, when the earth doesn't endure. It will pass away. When judgment comes, this will be gone. The word of the Lord, however, will stand forever because it is fixed in the heavens. And then Christ will come back, there will be a new world, uh, and we will enjoy peace and paradise with him on it. Verse 91, your laws endure to this day for all things and serve you. That would be a good verse to point to the people who say that the Bible is obsolete, that it's a set of outdated moral codes that we don't need to pay attention to anymore because we are so much smarter than the people who wrote this book. We understand the language better than they did. That word doesn't mean what you think it means. The word homosexuality, here's a good one. The word homosexuality, they will say, didn't appear in the Bible until 1947 when they updated the translation from the old King James. What they fail to realize is if they had any, you could just Google the word porneia in the Greek, and guess where we get the word pornography from? It refers to all manner of sexual immorality. And in the context, it talks about men lying with men as if they lied with women. And that practice itself is an abomination from the Lord. So I don't care when we came up with the term homosexuality and put it in the Bible. It means the same thing. The, your laws endure to this day. They didn't stop. And that means everything in this book endures to this day. For all things serve you, even God's law serves himself. What he gave us to guard our behavior, to keep us as guardrails, to keep us on the straightened path, serves him. Because it shows that a people who is willing to live by this book will not only be free from the power of sin and death, but we will be free to serve him. We are free, we are freer than any person that thinks that they are better off without the law because we serve him. We have chosen him, we have chosen to forsake ourselves, we have chosen to put our sin behind us, and we then can serve God, and that's how his law serves us, because we look into his perfect law that gives life, and when we do it, and we look into it, we don't forget what it says, we put it into practice, we will be blessed. This is what doesn't make sense to the people, to the world around us. They don't understand how people who could live their lives in their mind constrained by God's word could live a freer life and have a more joy-filled and satis satisfied life than the people who don't have his word. Because your law endures to this day and all things serve you. And then there's, oh, there's just so many more verses in here. We've only begun to scratch the surface of God's word. <clears throat> we'll go back to this note page for just 30 seconds. You know, time is irrelevant to a preacher, so when I say 30 seconds, just disregard. In Psalm 119, all those synonyms that he uses for God's word, the psalmist talks about he will delight in God's word, how he loves God's word, how he obeys God's word, how he meditates on God's word, how he rejoices in God's word, how God's word renews him and preserves him. And at different times, he says that uh, his appetite for God's word is, un is insatiable. His thirst for God's word is unquenchable. That when he thinks about God's word, he begins to just get anxious. Like we would, when we think about our 
favorite food and we begin to salivate. That's the effect that God's word has on the psalmist. He is so in love with God's word that he doesn't want to do anything apart from it because he doesn't want to disappoint the one who inspired the word. I want, I want us today, I want this church to be so enraptured and captivated by God's word that even Leviticus and Job being God's word should excite us. And I need to, I joked with the Sunday school class when we started Leviticus, right? I said, I, and I worked on this line. So judge, no, don't judge for yourselves whether it's sinful or not. I feel convicted to confess to you. I worked on my opening line to make a joke at the expense of God's word. I'm the preacher. But last Sunday, in Sunday school, I said, last Sunday, Sunday before, I said, I didn't think there was a book I was less excited to read than Job. And then Leviticus showed up and said, hold my drink offering. Uh, It's funny. But does it convey how much I truly love God's word? Because Leviticus is important. It's all about God's holiness. And the key verse is, be holy, therefore, as I am holy. That's what God desires in us. His word, his, his actions, everything. You realize God didn't die to make us happy. He died to make us holy. And I don't know that apart from his word. Many people will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. That's as haunting as the, gener- the generation in Judges that grew up without no knowledge of the Lord or what he had done. There are people out there who know about this much of the gospel, but what they know is wrong, or it's twisted, or it's perverted. That's why this word needs to be authoritative, and all of it. That's why his laws endure to this day, because all things serve him. We need to serve him by knowing his word and following his word. And then, as the farmer goes out to scatter seed, faithfully scatter this word. It's what got me here today. The idea of scattering seed, sowing seed, the word of God everywhere we go, peppering the landscape like Johnny Appleseed with Bible verses. Just throw them out wherever they go and let the Lord do the work. But we have to be the ones who are willing to take it, know it, and take it to where it needs to go. Trust that if it doesn't produce fruit that day, that someone's going to come along and water it. I know one thing. We have seeds that we started three weeks ago that haven't even begun to germinate yet because their germination time is like 28 days. Like, I'm giving up. I, I want to root around in there. I want to like get a little toothpick and see if there's anything happening beneath the soil. But I know that some seeds take a long time to germinate. That's how it is with folks in the world. Sometimes a seed takes a little bit of time to find good ground. But when it does, man, watch this baby light up and it's going to be good because God's causing the increase. So, on that note, I want to encourage you. Read, read Psalm 119 this week. Get into different pieces of it. And I'm, look, I don't even have notes. I just have verses to look at. Because I knew there was more to do here, there was, there's more to do than I could do. It would take me almost half a year to preach through the entire book if I just did one block at a time. And I just want you to get a taste It's to whet your appetite of what God's word is for us and what it can do in our lives and what he wants to do as it works its way through you and then out into the world. So read some more of this. We might look at more next week because it's really, really meaty stuff. But get into it. Know it and understand it. Meditate on it. Put it into practice. Draw strength from it. Receive comfort from it. Receive comfort so that you can comfort others. Because in your affliction, you've been comforted so that you can comfort others in their affliction. God doesn't waste experience. He will let you bless people as you've been blessed. So, I told you, time is irrelevant to a preacher. That's the longest 30 seconds you're ever going to sit through. Aaron, come up and we'll play our closing hymn, and then we'll get the kids up here, uh, because I'm really excited about communion today. So... Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that it is living and active. Thank you that it is eternal. Thank you that it makes us wise unto salvation. Thank you that it will not pass away. Thank you that it is good for teaching and preaching and correcting and rebuking and training in righteousness. God, thank you for what it is to our hearts. And thank you that it searches us and it exposes our own sinfulness, our wickedness and our disobedience. 
God, but that it doesn't leave us wallowing in our self-pity, God, that you have chosen through your word, through your living word, your son, to lift our lives up out of the pit, to redeem our lives, and to make us holy. And that, God, is where we find our source of joy, which exceeds happiness. God, thank you for who you are and the gift you've given to us in the Bible. In Jesus' name, amen.